Welcome to the Queen Trail Podcast. Meditation doesn't have to be sitting still and having an empty mind. The journey is such a beautiful thing because we are all on a journey. You want to make sure you have some kind of distribution plan, at least have an idea of it, because you can make this really amazing film and it only gets seen by your family and friends. Old Hollywood is still intact. Every horse runs hard, but when they win, and they know it. They've got this little sass about them. It was pretty rough. I had to go into the water and with my med pack, swim to the beach, treat these guys, put them on my back, swim out to the helo. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen those before. And I said, what are those? And before I could even finish the sentence, she said, oh my God, you didn't touch them, did you? Even if monarchs go away and never see one again, because there never will be monarchs again if they die out, it is just a little indicator of larger threats Man. My dad said, so what were you guys doing in the desert? And I said, we were taking nude photos. Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you had a great week since the last time that we got together. I'm going to go ahead and get right into this episode with my dear friend, Madison Silva, who is an artist. We are going to talk about AI, technology, and believe it or not, bugs, like real bugs, not computer bugs. We are covering a lot of different things, not as experts, just talking about the pluses, the minuses, the concerns, everything under the sun that has to do with AI. So it's a really interesting conversation. I do want to put a couple of things here at the front. One is that this was recorded prior to the resolution of the writer strike. And two trigger warnings. One is a stalker warning. And the other one is my grandmother terrorizing me as a child. So please listen with caution. And also, please grab a cuppa and join Madison Silva and I in this In the Company of Friends talk. Enjoy. I forgot everything for my Alabama trip, like everything. It was terrible. (laughs) So I even missed my flight. Like I missed the connecting flight. Oh, no. Uh, I almost started crying. So then I ran over to the counter to try to get on the next flight. And they're like, it's like six hours out. So I ended up just getting the rental car in Georgia and driving into Alabama from there. Oh, oh, but that was a pretty drive, though. I love driving in the South. It was so beautiful. I couldn't believe it. I was using Waze and it totally took me off of the main highway. So I was driving through these little (laughs) tiny towns the most quaint areas and these giant fields and forests and deer. There were deer on the side of the road. I mean, like it put me on roads where there were cow grates and, (laughs) but it was beautiful. (laughs) Oh yeah. I drove through Tennessee. I took a trip for, um, because originally I wasn't going to write the story I'm writing right now, which is Crook's Path, but I was working on a story called Border Town. I never say where it's set, but it's set in the Tennessee Appalachian section. So I went to Nashville. Oh, pretty. oh my gosh, so much green. And I went in May. So it was, I think it was like just going into the heat of summer. So everything was still really fresh. And I drove around for eight, nine hours. I just drove in a big circle from Nashville all the way down to Chattanooga, which is in the Georgia border. And I decided I was going to take all the country roads because I wanted to see what the farms looked like. I can imagine that Tennessee would be really pretty. I mean, I drove past like the Chattahoochee River and I'm like, I need to pull over and see this, but I just, I didn't have the time. So the next time I go back, I'm definitely going to do that. I mean, the navigation system just like totally put me off of the beaten path. And I went through some really, really cool places. And I don't know if I told you when we were talking last time that I love insects and bugs and if i had my whole entire life to do all over again i would be an entomologist and so i'm driving i would oh my god and it's just this crazy story because i was petrified 
of bugs when I was a kid and it was all my grandmother's fault. So I'm first, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are going to be like horrified when I tell you what she did, but I'm first generation American and my family's from Costa Rica and my grandmother was born in the early 1900s. And so I, you know, I'm like, I'm not excusing what she did, but she did what, you know, she had been taught. And she got irritated with me and she would take bugs and put them on me. Or this one time I specifically remember, like this memory is seared in my mind. She was walking me to kindergarten and there was a building that had been knocked down. And so the property had chain linked around it and the concrete was all broken up and there were all these red ants walking all over the place. And she grabbed a little baggie and took out a Kleenex and she picked up a bunch of those red ants and threw them in the baggie. And it was because I had done something that morning. God knows what I did. I was only like five years old. <laughs> um, and she said, just wait till you get home. And it was really scary because like it was already menacing and I did not want, you know, to do anything with these red ants. And I already knew that these red ants were going to be like a big deal that afternoon. And what she did was she put the whole baggie, she didn't take the ants out. It was sealed, put the whole baggie down my pants. Oh my and, God. I know. And it was petrifying. Um, she used to like chase me around the house with spiders and stuff. I mean, it's just like, what the heck was going through this woman's mind? You know, I, I mean, it's terrible. I, I should not be laughing, but I just the images that are going through my head. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's just like it, it's. I I don't know. I don't know. It is funny, and it and it's also you know like upsetting to me not not that I'm upset for myself it's like I'm upset for that little kid that I was like who does that to children you know <laughs> so I was petrified of every single bug on the planet I mean I ran away from flies I would scream if bees were near me I almost jumped out of a moving vehicle because I actually had the door open and the driver stomped on the brakes so that I would not jump out in the middle of the street because there was a crane fly in the car oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was this one time where I had to go to the bathroom at a public park and those big black California carpenter bees one of those ended up in there while I was using the bathroom and this whole bathroom was metal. So the buzzing was just multiplied and it sounded like there was a whole colony of these things in there. And I came running out of there. Thank God. I Somehow I actually pulled my pants up before I ran out of there, but I was like <laughs> so scared and I'm like screaming bloody murder. And I was there with one of my girlfriends and people were staring and like, I ran over to her and I sat down and she just gave me this really stern look, like, I am not having any of this nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so she talked to me. I, I don't really remember a lot of what she said. I do know that she said something like, if you do not get this fear of insects under control, you're going to pass this on to your children and they will behave like you do. And that day on my way home from work, I stopped at the bookstore and I got a bunch of books on insects and bugs. And I was so damn fascinated by them that I love them. And so like, here I am driving through Alabama and there's all of these fields there. And I'm actually thinking, I bet you there's some really cool bugs out there. I should pull over. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, I'm sure there are. <laughs> there were a lot. There were a lot. They ended up all over my windshield. But yeah, they've got like <laughs> some really big, beautiful dragonflies and butterflies. And 
I, I don't know. I don't know what else big old giant creatures. I'm sure it was like grasshoppers and whatever. But it makes you realize how these stories about fairies and forest people and all of that come about because it's these gorgeous fields that have these amazing things that fly out of them. And you're just like, wow, that's so magical, <laughs> you know? So it was pretty cool. That is awesome. I love that story. I love that story. And then you just tie it all together with, you know, it, it can take that, that fear and just form a passion out of it. Yeah. Knowledge is power. I mean, you know, I know that that's like the cliche, but it really is. As soon as I was <laughs> like, wait a minute, there are spiders that bring oxygen bubbles down to the bottom of ponds and live there. <laughs> you know, like, wait, oh what? Yeah, they're really? called bell. Uh huh. <laughs> they're called bell dome spiders, and they come up and grab some oxygen and bring it down, and they keep infusing these oxygen bubbles to build up a little home, and then they live in there and they like catch fish and whatever else swims past their little bubble homes. And, you know, dragonflies can fly backwards. There's kamikaze ants that will blow themselves up with uh, some sort of chemical that they create inside of themselves. They're usually the older ants of these colonies. And when a predator comes to attack the nest, these ants run out and they blow themselves up along, you know, like it'll be like 20 or 30 of them, whatever. And they blow the predator up and save the oh colony. My God. I mean, it's crazy, crazy stuff. They're, and then there's, you know, other ants are the most amazing critters. Like they're ranchers, like they'll, they'll ranch aphids. And <laughs> really? Because they're eating the fluids of plants, which is why you don't want them on your plants, they'll kill them. Right. What they release is like basically a nectar, or they call it a honey liquid. So then the ants will come over and they actually will milk the aphids. They'll like, protect the aphids and take them to better, you know, grazing areas, like the good parts of the plants. It, it's a trip. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know half of this stuff. And I grew up watching the discovery channel. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I don't think that they put enough about insects on any of these channels. I mean, they're just really fascinating. I remember sitting outside. I, I used to have two fig trees out there. One of them got so heavy with fruit, it fell over. It was really sad, but I still have one. And I would sit out there and read my book and just watch all of these bugs and birds and stuff. And this little skippy moth kept flying up towards the hummingbirds. And the hummingbirds would take off. And I was like, it's really weird, you know, and then the little skippy moth would go back down to the grass. Then the hummingbirds would come back and the little skippy moth would fly back up into the branches and the hummingbirds would take off like they were totally afraid. And I'm like, this is really bizarre. So I started watching them and it was like these little tiny skippy moths were scaring these birds that, you know, they might be tiny, but they were like bigger than this moth. And it was so aggressive. It was just like... <laughs> I don't want you in that tree while I'm eating nectar off of these flowers. You know, it, was just, <laughs> it was just really funny. So anyway, I could sit here and talk about insects all day long because they're all <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> and actually the hilarious thing is that the city that I was in, in Alabama, it's called Enterprise and their mascot is a bull weevil. So they have bull weevils. <laughs> all over the place <laughs> like, <laughs> like statues of them like every single store was named after the bull weevils and they have these like four and five foot tall statues of them everywhere it's just crazy why <laughs> that, what, are they very common down there <laughs> I mean... what i read is that in the early 1900s the bull weevils showed up en masse and ate up all the cotton, I'm sure for like, you know, the thousandth time in a row. And right. so somebody finally was like, if we diversify our crops and plant peanuts next year, and we'll be fine. So it's like, it's our mascot now. It's the herald of <laughs> prosperity. It's so silly that I'm just like, 
now that really didn't happen. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they're oh everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's that, oh my God. Wow. I just think like, this is why you need to travel because there's stuff like this all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> some very amazing things like I uh I grew up in a town called Truckee in Truckee California and oh if, yeah did, I don't know if we talked about this last time but no uh, no but it's kind of like by uh Tahoe yes it's just located just north of Tahoe uh, do you know who the Donner Party is yes and I have been to that statue yes that was my hometown <laughs> That oh was where gosh. I grew up. I, uh, yeah, that statue. Um, <laughs> I was just recently watching a documentary about the Donner Party and everything that they had gone through. And, you know, as somebody who grew up looking at all of these places, eat, have, having eaten at all of these places, having skied at Donner Pass, at, just have swam in Donner Lake, mm. it never occurred to me that we name a lot of things after cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, they weren't cancelled by choice, but we had this spaghetti meat sauce platter in one of the restaurants. I don't know if it's still up there, but they called it the the Donner plate or something like that. And it's this like oh red sauce and everything, and I'm just like, it never occurred to me. <laughs> oh my god. Ah. <laughs> You can find some weird things when you travel. And I mean, even if when you travel back, you'll kind of go, oh, wait, that's a little messed up. (laughs) That is hilarious. Oh, that's so bad. I'm just getting like, most recently, I watched Yellow Jackets. I think it was on Amazon Prime or something. Did you happen to see that? No, but it sounds familiar. So it's about a girls' soccer team. Their plane falls out of the sky, and they end up stuck for like 18 months. And like cannibalism happens because it's snowing and there's no food and somebody dies. And anyway, those are the images that are going through my mind right now. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> spaghetti platter with meatballs in it and the red sauce. That's just black comedy. <laughs> it really is. We have an obsession with that name. And we, I, I don't know if the residents are fully aware of what happened or if we just live in denial. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) I just, yeah. I mean, I can't eat spaghetti now without that image. So, Oh, that's so funny. I think what ends up happening is like with things that are really terrible, we tend to use black humor to get us through it because it's so bad that we need to find something funny to kind of balance it out. There's so much distance between modern day and when these travelers went through there, you know, like what a what a bad decision they made. I mean, there was no way that they could know this is what was going to happen. And it was like the storm of the century that they ended up colliding with. But it's just been a lot of time that's passed. And so we're like, okay, let's make some fun of this. It's about time. You know? <laughs> right. it, it really is. You have to have a sense of humor. I think just in life in general, if I don't know how I survived without having a sense of humor and being able to laugh at all the ridiculous <laughs> things that I do, ridiculous ways that I think. I, you know, when you take yourself so seriously, it's life's not really all that great. <laughs> it it kind of sucks. <laughs> Life is hard. I mean, it just it just really is. It's really tough. And, you know, we just have to find the ways to get from one catastrophe or, you know, one bad situation. They might not all be catastrophic, but to the next, you know, and then you're okay and you kind of can laugh about it and stuff. But right. um, I think, you know, life is like that all the way through. And so, so you do have to have that sense of humor to get you prepared for the next time something happens. <laughs> yeah. Everything always just kind of works out too. Like one of the jokes I tell people, especially my managers, I will do the job and it will look fantastic. However, you have to grant me 10 minutes to freak out and scream so that I can get it out of my system. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I just need the freak out period. That's it. <laughs> 
you know, it seems to me like the older I get, the more seconds I have to add to freak out periods. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's like experience, like because I have added a few worst case scenarios along the years. And so I need those extra <laughs> seconds, you know, right. I can totally see that. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> just, just give me the freak out period and then, you know, I'll get over it. Just let me be dramatic. I just need, I just need to be dramatic for a moment. <laughs> I'll go back to normal. I promise. <laughs> for 10 minutes. Do not talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. That's so funny. <laughs> so we were going to talk about something else that, you know, really makes people get stressed out. And it's almost like a black and white argument. You're either on one side or you're on the other side of it. And that is AI. Yep. And all the, the havoc that it's wreaking for artists. Well, not just artists, but writers. Um, there was a meme I saw, and I don't remember everyone, but I think they used the Marvel Endgame last ending battle scene. And it's like, you have all these artists that are, are trying to attack the AI community or uh, the people that are for the AI. And then you have like crafters and quilters and all these old school artists are just like, eh, you know, it is what it is. But I mean, I don't think that's what they think, but... I think a lot of people are afraid right now of what is going to happen in terms of like value of their work. Uh, I know that the Writers Guild is going through something right now. I haven't really been paying close attention to that because I hate news. I hate watching news. I I want action explosions and all the good stuff. But (laughs) one of the biggest controversies that is going on right now actually has to deal with copyright infringement. In fact, this is probably the most concerning aspect of the whole AI generating art deal. And I, I think you're absolutely right. It is a very black and white I'm not exactly sure how the algorithm works or how the actual program gathers the images and all of that. I do know that it is taking styles. I do believe it is taking parts of images and just meshing it in together to form one giant picture. Now, the question comes is, do those artists get the credit for the work that they have you know, spent hours and hours and hours of their life trying to learn how to perfect and here's this program that can just create something instantly in a very similar style and how do they get the credit is their work getting stolen and I I actually can see and I do feel a little bit nervous about that has my art been used um you know there's somebody making money off of my work however the best analogy that I can think of that this is a hard topic for me to talk about because there's so much politics behind it there's so much legal issues behind it and i am not a legal political type of person i just want to create stories and that's it however when i was working on crumbs they were trying to describe all the monsters to me and i had ideas and it was actually crumbs the actual monster itself i was stuck on this one idea of how the monster was going to look the monster version of this character kind of a grim reaper style they wanted this scarecrow venom looking thing and we weren't quite meeting each other we weren't on the same page when he went out and he started to gather inspiration and he started to send me like this is what i'm looking for i I like this part of it i like this part of it that is how i'm able to create what it is they have i can't read their minds i can't see what it is they're seeing you know i can only take what they are communicating to me and you know you could be a really good communicator and you can be really efficient in telling them exactly what you want but i'm still going to see something else in my head i have a tendency to be a, a skim reader i don't read into details all that well so ai is kind of like a hammer you can build a beautiful home using a hammer as one of your tools However, there are also serial killers that like to use hammers to kill people. (laughs) It's kind of, you know, it it does suck because there are people out there who are going to abuse this tool. 
that does help artists such as myself when they're working with clients and they can't quite understand what it is that they are looking for. It's a useful tool, but it can't be abused. So how do you regulate a tool like this? I mean, how do you regulate hammers? You can't really regulate them. You can't do background checks on them like you can with guns. So it's the controversy really lies in terms of the copyright infringements because if somebody is going to take what they've generated and use it to sell another piece of work, like how does how do you give the credit to the art that was used in that image? Because it's not going to be recognizable. It's not going to be something like that was my art when it doesn't really look anything like what you have drawn before. And again, I don't really understand exactly how the AI algorithm works or how it gathers images and puts them together. But there was a controversy between an artist called Alfonso, who I believe is on YouTube, and an artist named Jake Parker. Both of them had released books. Now, if you don't know who Jake Parker is, he is the guy who is behind Inktober. He was the one that uh, that I know of that created it, who started it up. He started the whole prompt thing. And he's actually the reason why we have it today. Well, he released a book about inking and he released kind of like a, uh, like a how-to book either six months earlier, or I, I don't remember the time frame, but earlier, the YouTuber Alfonso had also released an inking book. And he started going over the two books, and apparently he was accusing Jake Parker of ripping off of his book. So there was a huge debate that was going on off of this. Like, did Jake Parker really just take you know did he really plagiarize this book or is he applying a lot of information that Alfonso did not really create himself Alfonso I'm probably not saying his name right he was presenting the techniques that are taught in a lot of art schools these are not unknown techniques. He did not patent these techniques. Like these are not his techniques alone. They are a very common technique used by inkers. So is Jake Parker really plagiarizing or is he just taking the same concepts and showing them in his book? And now the other thing is Alfonso is showing the images that were being used and how they were very similar. The layout was very similar. And all I could think of was every art book looks like that every art book is formatted like that did jake parker plagiarize i i don't really know i kind of fell off of the controversy there but let's go back to the ai generated art there are so many different styles out there there are a lot of people who mimic each other's style I mean, there's chippy artists, there's anime artists, there's a lot of people who mimic uh, Ghibli animation. There's a lot of people that will mimic the DC or the Marvel drawing style. It's not like just one person draws this style. So when you see all of this AI art being generated, and it looks similar to somebody else's style, where can you actually say that was my piece or they're using my art? And where, where is the copyright infringement part on that? I am nervous about AI art in not necessarily replacing artists, but I am afraid of the marketplace, the selling, the business aspect of it getting damaged by all of this. And <sighs> copyright laws are extremely fragile. They're kind of vague. So you cannot make money off of Disney licensed characters but you can draw fan art and you can sell this fan art. But there's a line that is really hard to distinguish. So I, th I think a lot of this controversy right now is, is really coming out because there's no real clarity in the law where you know we're getting worldwide global communication and interaction. I mean, our, our art is reaching beyond region that were possible 10 years ago, but we're also facing the risks that come with the digital world where, you know, we're getting spam calls every day, we're getting hacked. I just bought my domain and I had to buy protection for it because that's where we are at. Right. So it, it's, it's a difficult one.
It is. It is. And I think going back to your analogy of, I mean, there's a lot that I could talk about here, but specifically a couple of images that came up in listening to you were your analogy of the hammer can build a beautiful home or it can put a picture up on the wall for you, but it can also be used by a serial killer And one of the things that they're finding with AI is like things that come out that just kind of shock you. And one of them is if you look up Shudu, which is spelled S-H-U-D-U, she is a South African model that has appeared in Vogue and she's got sponsorships all over the place. She is an AI generated 3D black woman who is gorgeous. She's got that strong jawline and just amazing. And she was created by a white man named Cameron James Wilson, who is making bank off of her. And that puts you right smack in the middle of this bubbling pot of ethics and the fact that a white man is taking jobs away from real black women. And it's really astounding. Like when I saw that, I was like, what the heck? And you have to have people who are willing to play along. You've got all of these different sponsors that are providing money to Cameron James Wilson for the use of his AI generated model. He wouldn't be making the money if there wasn't a market for her. And that's a huge ethical argument that, hey, if you see this person, she's not real. And you might want to think ethically about supporting the companies that are willing to use her instead of, I don't really know the names of the models anymore. There were a lot of supermodels. So like Naomi Campbell, for instance, it's just a hard argument because the ethics and then the speed by which technology is advancing Nobody can even keep up with it. As soon as something is identified as a problem that we need to work on and, you know, the the legal world is just so full of contradictions. So then things get hung up in the legal system. And meanwhile, technology is just like racing to this point where we can't even catch up to it. So I know that there's part of that, the way that the algorithm works, I did want to speak a little bit on that, is that as sets of data are introduced into a system, whether it's, you know, chat GPT or mid journey, that information is taken in and it's, it's an additional data set that then is used to create more. And the, and the more data that is fed into these systems, the more they're able to be much more accurate. And so I was really interested in it. So I did play around a little bit and it is exactly what you said. You put in a prompt and just be really specific about what you want. And then in the end you say in the style of, and you put that artist's name in and you'll end up with three or four different scenes that look similar to that artist. Um, You can even do that with ChatGPT right now. Like you could say, here's the story I want to write, write it in the style of Snoop Dogg. And then all of a sudden you've got the, you know, faux shizzle and all that stuff going in that story. (laughs) So you can do things like that. (laughs) One of the things that I do tell people, because it is the conversation of the moment, it's not that I'm an expert on it. It's just that it is the conversation of the moment. And it's going to be the conversation of the moment for a really long time because it's affecting so many people and there's so many unknowns with it is, and I feel like this about anything, understand the thing that you fear. And I did not have any idea whatsoever that we were going to start out talking about how I conquered my fear of bugs and now like 
these things are really amazing, you know. Um, I think that we need to do that more often is here is this thing that is really troubling me and is taking up a lot of my time and my worry and my emotions and creating so many questions in my head that I am starting to become maybe a little bit fearful of it get on there, get on chat GPT and see what it does and see that it's really not that great. Chat GPT specifically, its information ends September 2020. So if you ask chat GPT to write anything or give you any information after September of 2020, it does not have that information in there. Now, it is not the only program that can write. There are other AI systems that can write for you that probably have information after September 2020, but it is the biggest one. And they did stop it at that point. However, you can do things like introduce a whole entire passage of something that occurred after that time period. Ask it if it understands that and then set up your group of questions based on that information that you just introduced. So there's ways around it. And of course, there's a lot of things that can be done that are not that great because the laws, the guidelines, the regulations, all of that sort of stuff, like you said, it's very murky. It's open water right now. You don't know what you're going to run into. And it opens things up to people who can create another shoe do. I think that the more that we understand AI, the more the artists, the people that are being affected by this, the creators, the writers, et cetera, the more they're going to be able to affect those guidelines and laws and regulations that go around them. You know, like right now, like you mentioned, the Screenwriters Guild, they are trying to set things up so that AI cannot take over their jobs so that the studios are not accepting anything that is written by, you know, a robot, so to speak. And so I kind of think what's going to end up happening is there's going to be studios that are like, absolutely no AI. And then you're going to have the studios that are like, you know what, we're wide open to whatever. And so I think there's like these divisions that are going to occur. I also think that some of this, you know, when you start looking back at what's happened prior to where we are right now, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a book called Steal Like an Artist. And there were a lot of memes that came from that. It was by Austin Kleon. K-L-E-O-N. But like it was one of the top sellers. Basically what he was saying is learn, study. He wasn't advocating to steal things, but it was like learn, study, understand, become like the artists that you admire so that you can produce art of that same caliber. But it's really easy with social media to take things out of context and put it out there like, you know, well, Austin Kleon said that I can steal and AI is here. So that's what I'm going to do, you know. (laughs) Right. Well, it's funny that you're talking about the forgery, um, the what he is talking about, because there is a history of forgers who literally become the painter that they're copying off of, and they will create an exact replica down to the brush strokes from these artists. You know, uh, I know there are quite a few Van Gogh forgeries created. I think it was more common with the Impressionists, but there have been forgers. I mean, people have been stealing art and copying art for years, I mean, hell it's one of the training techniques in art schools is you do what are called master paintings you are literally trying to replicate what these masters have done so that you can see the techniques that they are doing because that is the best way you're going to learn a technique so art schools are actually kind of even kind of teaching people how to how to make forgeries if you think about it but once again it's just a tool how, how does that saying go there's Originality is dead. It's very hard to create something original. It's very hard to create a new original technique. It is 
very difficult. Um, I, I don't want to speak for writers because I'm not really a writer myself, even though I'm writing my own story. I'm going through this process with my co-writing friend, and she is guiding me through this story arc, the plot arc, the character arc. And a good story is going to follow this arc, maybe not necessarily like uh, in a certain timeline where everything has to happen in certain times, but there is always an arc that happens. If you think about it, like all of our scenarios and our situations and our lives, we're not really necessarily unique or original. I mean, there's always somebody else out there who has been through what we've been through. The situation was different, mm -hmm. but the scenario is still the same. You know, you still have those heartbroken women that were ghosted by somebody and, you know, believing that they were never going to find love again. It's funny that you say that because I just... After being in Alabama, I am obsessed with Hank Williams and his whole entire life. So I've been watching Hank Williams films and I'm like, oh my God, he is XYZ in my life. You know, like personalities. And I think psychologically, I, um, I'm going to have to look this up and, you know, I may or may not put things in the show notes in regards to this. I might let, you know, the listener figure it out, but there are a limited number of personalities that are out there, despite the number of people that are on this planet. It's just, it's a finite number. And like you were saying, the elements are the same in a lot of stories. When it happens to each person, there are unique parts of it, but there are still the same set of elements will result in a tragedy or they will result in a, like a triumph. So yeah, it's hard to find things that are novel that have not been done before. And people, people are pretty successful at it, but it's usually a mashup. And if you start to distill the various components of a piece of art, of a film, of a story, whatever it might be, whatever that creative product is, when you start to distill the individual constituents of it, you find that they are similar in some ways to something else. It's kind of like with music, there's only so many notes and those same notes make up all of the songs that we hear. And it's just the, the, the combination in which they've been put together result in something that is different in some way. Yeah. Uh, I remember somebody, when you're talking about personality, somebody once told me that there are only so many facial features. So there are between five to seven people at any given time on the planet that look identical to us. Your doppelganger. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? It is insane, but it's almost reassuring. There is actually something a little bit scary about having a unique problem that nobody else has ever had before. You know, you don't, it's hard to reason out and get a solution. But when you've had other people that have had the problem before, like you have somewhere you can go and you can, I like, well, how did you get through it? Well, is there a way out of it? You can, you can get help from it. I, I don't know if maybe it's tied to social media and, and tied to this cultural or societal need to stand out, be different, be special in some way. I, I especially think that's very common on uh, social media. We want to be special. You know, I, I look at my, 12 likes on a recent post and then I, I look at you know these artists that have 5,000 yeah being liked that desire to be different or unique in some way that causes us to find ways to either replicate something you know we notice when something is really good or somebody is doing something really fantastic we notice that and we're like we want that you know and actually, it's so funny because I was just thinking about a film that I really like, and it's just exactly the same as what you said with art. Like you study those particular features or you study other artists or, 
you know, the art schools are kind of teaching you how to steal elements by encouraging you to study a particular artist. And it's the same thing with film. You know, if there's something or a story, I will reread or I will rewatch an infinite number of times something that really worked for me. Like, not because I want to steal the words or I want to steal the description or, you know, any part of something, but I want to see how those elements were cobbled together to have a particular result that I really identified with so that I could recreate a similar result with a different story. And so when I think about that, and I think about all of the forgeries that you were talking about, over time, before AI was even a thing, like people can be really ingenious and really exacting and able to just replicate things. You look at people who do portraits of other people and they replicate them perfectly. You know, it's just like, whoa, this is amazing. It kind of makes you wonder how AI really differs from that. I know that there's that fear that my hard work and my time and my effort is going to be stolen, but people want a new Van Gogh or a new Dolly. I think Dolly was another one that was forged a lot. How is AI different from something that was happening prior to it being a reality? One of my friends just posted a whole series of photos that were labeled AI photos. Some of them are super realistic. Some of them look like paintings. Some of them, it's clearly some fantasy world. And I think that one of the things is that AI needs to be clearly labeled AI because I also do not think that producing good AI doesn't require skills. So there's also this whole additional subset of skills that an AI artist, and I know people just cringe at that, but they've learned to program or they've learned to create prompts that produce what they want. And the only reason I say that is because I have played around with Mid Journey and with Night Cafe. And trust me, I will never be showing the stuff that I <laughs> produced on there because it's not that easy. I've played with Chat GPT. It's not like somebody goes in there and says, produce a graphic art panel with this particular story in the style of Madison Silva or produce a script with this scene in the style of Sil Annan and you're immediately going to get something like that. It's not that simple. I mean, there's a lot more that goes in there into finessing and creating something that looks like your work or looks like my work. So that's why when I've played around with these programs, I emphasize like If it is something that is stressing you out, learn about it. Like use the programs, they're free. You know, that's one thing. And really get a feel for what it takes to produce some of that art because often it's like subject matters that the original artist or the original writer wouldn't have even written about or painted. So that's always one giveaway. But I think still with all of this that I'm saying, I still think that there are a lot of guidelines and regulations and laws that need to be built around, you know, create these parameters around how AI can interact in our real world, in the world that we currently live in, without infringing on the copyrights or the hard work that the artists that are being imitated have put in. I think we're a really long way away from that. However, the fact that so many people are aware of it now and like you can create some really, really cool images. I mean, I know Instagram was doing a trend for a while that you were creating your face in the style of other people. And that's something that's fun. Like 
I don't see a problem with something like that. You're not making money off of anything. You're not really, it's just for fun. And it could also be a great learning tool. You know, as I've said before, we studied masters. Why not take an AI generated art and study it, use it to get inspiration. I'm for adapting. Like this is not something that's going to go away. Unfortunately, our world is turning into a very digital world. AI has been around for a very long time. I really think that until we can understand it a bit more, I think we need to just kind of adapt to having it in our lives, you know, fight. I absolutely fight for our rights to be protected, our our creative rights. But it is something that I, I think a lot of people just, they're too afraid of almost to read up on. It reminds me of another incident that happened. Uh, God, I think it was 10 years ago, maybe, maybe less than that. But, you know, there was a big thing going on about a new law that was either going through or it was just in the proposal stage. And I don't remember the specifics. I don't remember the name of this law, but it was that the website that the images were hosted on was going to be owned by the website. But I found some counter arguments. Laws are just written very, very weird. And sometimes they do that on purpose. And other times it's just to keep it vague. But the website actually wasn't going to own them. It it was like, it was almost worded to be more like protection. Because there was a thing going on where they were taking images off of these websites and taking them to sell. They were making prints and selling them online. So that was a big thing that was going on. You know, I, I just discovered that my printer does prints. I can actually print on photo paper with like really good quality prints. It's really easy for me to go find an image by one of my favorite artists, print it out, and then just post it up or because I'm trying to start a line art business and selling prints like you know what's to stop me from doing that that's been going on for years right it has but we've had to adapt to this problem you know that's what life is it's it's not a series of fixing things it's more of a series of adapting to things we don't really fix problems we adapt to the problems and now the problems like you know we could in this solution we're fixing them in a way but a lot of times we're just adapting to it. Now, I think adaption and denial, I, I want to make it clear that adaption is not denial. <laughs> right. I think that in some ways you do have to adapt to some levels. I mean, you know, the most extreme level of adaption would be denial. But I think there's different levels of adaption because you have to be able to continue to create and live and think in a way that will possibly solve some of the problems. I mean, I think it's going to take a community. And so it's good that there is so much awareness and that the awareness continues to grow as to what the problems are or what the potential problems are. You know, I think that we're always looking for stop gaps and quick solutions that are complete. But like you said, those laws are fluid. And, you know, it's really funny because I was just talking about an incident that happened and these new laws that are being passed on the criminal front in Los Angeles right now, as of October 1st, there's going to be these site and release, book and release, or magistrate review guidelines that apply to different crimes. And the goal is for there not to be a financial burden on the criminal, which serves and protects the criminal the way that these new bail regulations are written. And I was having a discussion about that and something happened to me a while ago where without going into huge detail on it, there was somebody who trespassed onto my property when I had a reasonable expectation of privacy and the cops came at like two o'clock in the morning, caught the guy. He was cuffed, put in the back of a cruiser and one of the cops came up to the door and I'm thinking, oh, he's going to talk to me about this arrest procedure and some, you know, victim instructions or whatever. 
And instead he said, well, do you have anything else to add to this complaint? Cause we're going to release him. And I was like, what, what? Oh my God. are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And I'm like, he was trespassing. This incident actually prompted me to get cameras. He had lots of pictures of raccoons and possums coming into my yard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was, you know, it, it was just such a lesson after I got over being upset about it. And, you know, one of the things that I did to advocate for myself was when I realized that this officer was literally just like, I am not going to fill out a report. I'm not going to arrest this guy. Like, that is not part of my plan for this evening. Too bad, lady. I did know that I could have called the watch commander at that point and really escalated this, but it was 2.30 in the morning. I was in shorts and a tank top. It was misting and freezing outside. I had no intention of being outside, uh, you know, so I was not right. for like you know, mid 50s. <laughs> And, and again, I was tired. I had a lot of things that I needed to do the next day, which is why I was up so late. I decided not to ask for the watch commander because I would have been dealing with this until four or five o'clock in the morning. And I said, I'm coming down to your car. I want to see who this is, because if this person returns, I want to know that they're coming. And so I went down and I did see this person and then he was uncuffed. And the three of us just watched him walk down the middle of the street and into the darkness. And it was like really troubling and really, um, it just really bothered me so much. Like I felt like there is no relief for this criminal problem, which I can use as an analogy for AI and all of these other things like that desperate place that you find yourself in when there's a real problem and there's nobody there to help you with it. And the one thing that I realized is that police and all of these laws are very fluid and they are designed to allow the least amount of work and the least amount of effort to prevail, which is not that they are fair. Like they say, justice is blind. I don't feel like I got justice in that situation. I don't feel like a lot of people are feeling like there is a lot of creatives are feeling like there is justice with this AI situation at the moment, but you do end up adapting at a certain point. And just knowing what that playing field is, what the rules of the game are and understanding what your options are helps you navigate through these difficulties a whole lot better. It doesn't provide an answer, but like my statement when I was, when I was talking to my friend about that story I just told is, you know, cops are not here to save you. They're here to apply the law in the least restrictive manner possible. And it's up to us to advocate for ourselves so that we can get some sort of satisfaction. Um, but that always requires us to give up a portion of the fight, which nobody wants to do. And it also requires you to step up and be either braver or more forceful than you wish to be. And I think that with AI, the communities are going to get to that point. I don't know when, I don't know how, but that will happen. And I don't know if that helped at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I came into this conversation only understanding what the fear was. You know, I'm, I'm not a big reader, particularly on current events. I, I just, I haven't. I only know from my own personal experience, I just know from what I have watched through YouTube and a lot of opinions about it. This has been very informative for me because, yeah, we need to understand not just AI and, and how it, it's affecting our lives and who it's affecting, but I think even more so, we need to look at the laws that are involved. And I, I never really understood that cops are here to enforce the law in the least restrictive 
way possible. Is that what you, how you put it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the least restrictions. And nothing is ever as black and white as we'd like it to be. I mean, I'm not thrilled that this person is still walking around. So it bothers me, but I also happen to know who this person is in a different sense, which is, you know, if I see this person in the vicinity, I know what might be happening. I know how to respond to it. I have a whole new set of information that I can apply to the situation so that the results are more favorable for me and my safety. And I think that, you know, again, it's understanding more of what creates the fear. It's not eliminating the problem, but it's clarifying it a little bit more so that it can be resolved in some way. And a, a lot of times, I think, I think every time pretty much with anything, it's the best that we can do. If something is really freaking us out, learning about it resolves some of the problem because most problems are layered. There's a lot of layers that are in there. And if you can pull some of those layers away by knowledge, it makes the other ones clearer so that you can actually apply some action to them and come up with better solutions. I agree. We fear the unknown. That's generally where fear is coming from. Mm -hmm. AI is really interesting because we creatives take so much pride in education, the amount of time put in studying and perfecting and their experience and just getting to where they are. And it's really frightening to think that machine learning can steal all of that from you. I mean, it's, it's the theft of intellectual property and that's the last thing that you can hold on to. You know, Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, he said something like, and this is not a direct quote, but the last thing that a man can own is that which is in his mind. And we are here at a point where AI can steal that. And that's frightening. It's a huge invasion of privacy. And I think I'm more terrified of not so much the art being stolen, but I'm terrified of somebody who can literally damage, you know, a non-artist life. Like I'm bringing up scammers because I'm getting nothing but calls and DMs and texts from scammers right now. What if a scammer can access technology like that and just somehow just take over our lives? They can generate our voice. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if we're there yet, but but the way how technology is going, you know, they've done holograms on news channels. You know, we're not that far away from microchips in our brains. I remember somebody, a millionaire, was talking about that. And, you know, there's also the good side of all of this stuff. I mean, like, honestly, when you said a microchip, I thought, oh, I'd like to microchip like a foreign language into my brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Just all of a sudden be able to speak that or have a microchip popped in there that lets me figure out how to create a Michelangelo style statue out of marble or something. There are actually good aspects to this technology. I think it's not all terrible. You know, chat GPT, you can run stories through it and ask it to find the weak points in your story. You know, I, I am not discounting for a moment that there are some serious problems with the use of this technology. But when you do take away some of those fears and dare to kind of get your toes wet a little bit, you find out that there's some really good utilizations for these AI programs. I don't think that we're going to come up with a good solution for those big problems at this point. And again, you know, going back to Shudu, I think it's such a perfect example because there is a market out there for her. And I think that the more that we as consumers learn, oh, this company is using AI generated, basically stolen art or, you know, really ethical issues like Shudu, I will not 
support. And that's one way to push back, you know. I think there's a lot more ethical people out there than our fears lead us to believe that there are. And at some point, we're going to be going through a big upheaval with this in all of the creative fields. There will be an understanding of who's using what and how we want to support those organizations or those businesses or those companies. I think one of those solutions would be what you have stated before was creating AI art as its own separate art form. I mean, actually, I remember people not taking well to digital painting because it had the control Z function. It had lasso tool. It had a whole bunch of tricks that traditional painters and artists don't have. And a lot of people did not consider digital painting as an art form. Right. I dabbled for like a night with an AI art generator. I don't remember which one. I wanted to get inspiration for armor, but I wanted sci-fi, cyberpunk, like dinosaur stone armor. Like I I was putting in all these keywords and I was getting very messed up images. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. it is not easy. 20 fingers on one hand type of thing. (laughs) Oh, like, yes. The one arm is like, I had a T-Rex with an arm that was like all the way on the other side of the painting. (laughs) It was cut off. I mean, it it was like, yeah, that's an AI created painting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's literally what I get when I go on these sites. That's hilarious. Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> they're terrible and I'm like I could have painted something better than this and half the time too it took me forever to get my stuff <laughs> yes. but one of the guys that I'm working with one of my clients is really really good at it and he's created some really cool things I don't know if he's selling them I don't know what he's doing with it but it's they're interesting images to look at But he always states, this is an AI created image. Mm -hmm. And so I I do believe, you know, maybe we, you know, I I guess, again, back to my whole adaption talk, maybe we need to adapt to it the same way you adapted to digital art. I know a lot of people who still don't like digital art. They'd rather have a traditional watercolor or a traditional oil painting in their home. But that doesn't discount what I do. I I still had to learn how to mix all the colors. Like, so we know that red and blue get purple, uh, yellow and red get orange. So in the traditional media, blue and yellow give you green. In the digital format, it gives you gray. Oh. I don't know why. I don't know why. You have to, you actually literally have to pick the green you want, unless there's a trick that I don't know about yet. You cannot mix colors the same way. With traditional media, it's much more, you have to block out the colors. You can do some blending, but with digital media, you can't just pick up the blend tool and or the smudge tool blur tool and just start blurring away it looks terrible you actually have to learn how to use opacity to mix all this stuff together so there's still a lot you have to learn with the tool because it is just a tool i I guess when you kept talking to me about the good things and you kept talking about ai getting better and better I kept thinking about a YouTube video that I watched a little while back, and it was about AI being sentient. And the guy was arguing that AI will never be fully 100% sentient because AI has to be programmed. Every time it makes a choice, the choice was already pre-programmed. Now, could it choose one of those programs? It will never be able to fully pick and choose and create what we see in our heads, it has to be programmed into it. It has to be told what to do. And even then, you you still can't tell it what angle or which direction or you you have to, you know, I, I don't know how they get such specific images. But I know for myself, I have to go through thumbnail after thumbnail after thumbnail to figure out, okay, what is going to work best. There is a level of choices and decisions that programming cannot quite make and yes it can learn but it's still taking something that's already been done it cannot take something new 
it's that finessing and the nuances of that human touch that is missing that personality. I, God, I was such a huge fan of Star Trek. And one of the uh, themes that was often tackled was that of Data wanting to be a human and never able to achieve that because he was an android. And no matter how much he tried to replicate human thought, human emotion, emotion, you can try to mimic it, but you can't replicate it. And as human beings, we do know the difference. And I think that that is that special touch that goes into a script or a novel or an illustration. We are able to provide an emotion because we can feel that emotion. We can read body language. We can we can do all sorts of things that a computer won't necessarily be able to do. Right. And I, you know what I really liked was when you said that one of the solutions or the solution might be to create a subcategory of art that is AI generated, you know, like all of the crypto art that was created. Like, so that's another thing that like came and went in the blink of an eye, made a lot of people a lot of money, but it's also like something that's not even talked about anymore as technology has progressed so far beyond. But I remember when, when I was a kid and everybody was just yelling and screaming about disco, <laughs> you know, somebody had printed a bunch of stickers that just said disco and they were slapping them underneath the word stop on stop sign. And, you know, so it's like, <laughs> and, you know, it was like, this isn't music. There's always been an argument about what is correct. What is the best thing? You know, like, is country music better than rock and roll? What happened to metal? When I was growing up, that was like my go-to music. But there's these fads, you know, like I remember when Van Halen put out the song Jump. And all of a sudden, it wasn't hard rock anymore. There's like a freaking synthesizer in there. Like, what the heck is <laughs> going on? And everybody's just like, ah. And it's actually one of my least favorite Van Halen songs. And some people love it because the synth is in there. But we go through these upheavals, you know, like we went from silent film to talkies to black and white to colored film, you know, and then there's all of these different genres of every type of creative product that's out there. There's these different genres of written material. And, you know, you go through all of the, with film, all of the CGI. And there's, like you said, going from hand painted to digital art. I think that when new technologies, new processes are introduced, we all just go, whoa, that's an affront to everything that I've known. And eventually you kind of learn a little bit more about it and you're like, okay, well, there's that category of stuff that I like. And then there's this other stuff that I don't like. I either don't consider it art or do for this reason, or I can see the differences between these two and I like them both. And I think that at some point AI will be there too. And we might in five years be having the same conversation about a different technology and AI went the way of crypto art. <laughs> Well, we could also be facing a whole nother art dilemma too, that's, you know, gonna be uh, endangering creatives. There's so much with technology, with the way how technology is progressing, you know, the way our, our mind as a society is starting to change. We're starting to have different perspectives. You know, and I don't know if that's because of the new generation that's coming in. I'm a millennial, so I don't really know what's going on with the rest of the generations or how this whole cycle works with changing of the minds and all that. But I think with new technology coming out, with new problems arising like climate change, uh, electric vehicles, you know, as, as these new problems come up, we start adapting and we start we start trying to find solutions for all of these issues. And through those solutions, we're going to find other technologies. Mm -hmm. Who knows what's going to come about? And I think that's why I, I take the mindset of adapt. 
you know, you, you still defend yourself where you need to defend your rights as a creative. I, I do believe in boycotting. We are allowed to, we are allowed to stand up for our values. We are allowed to stand up for our ethics. You know, but we're allowed to follow our values. But so I, I was kind of having a conversation with myself in the cars I tend to have. And I'm always bothered by people's opinions. And I, I had to tell myself, you know, opinions are neither wrong or right. They're just a perspective. Mm-hmm. And just because I don't like it, there could be something good. It's just my perspective. It is my perspective that I don't think AI art is really all that bad. I think it can make a wonderful addition to our art community. It can allow people who want to make things, make things. You know, it, there, there's an opportunity there. But then again, that's just my perspective. And everyone's perspective is different. I, I have a friend at work who's vegan. I don't completely agree with it only because I come from the mindset of a weightlifter. I need a lot of protein. I can't eat soy. I can't eat, you know, lentils and beans. I have issues with them. I, I kind of need my chicken for protein. You know, and I'm sure there's a solution out there somewhere and I'm always keeping my eye out for it because I do want to be environmentally conscious as well. But then again, it's just perspective. It's just our perception. And my perception always changes with the more information that I get, tying back to what you're saying about knowledge. The more I learn, the more I start to question, the more I start to understand more and more of what it is I am afraid of. And it's from there that my opinion is going to change. It is 100% okay to change your opinion. Took me 35 years to figure that out, but it is 100% okay to change your mind. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's always additional information coming in. The world keeps progressing and expanding based on what's going on at that time. And it's never the same from moment to moment. So you do have to be as open-minded as you can comfortably be about a lot of subjects out there on the horizon. And and one of the things that you said that really struck me was when you were talking about how you're a millennial and you don't really understand how other generations are dealing with some of these things. And I'm often just struck by the fact that there are generations now who were born into the social media era, who were born into a reality where privacy they have been stripped away. And there's people who are being born into the time of AI, and that's just going to be their reality. They're never going to know anything prior to that time. You know, I mean, I'm way older than you are. So I remember this one time, he, you know, was probably like in third grade or something. And he was like, Mom, somebody was talking about a Walkman today. What's a Walkman? And I'm like, Oh, you know, <laughs> prior to that, there was this, and, and then there was this, and I'm like, oh my God, how do I even? You didn't, you didn't have the loop function. You just had to manually rewind that stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's just so funny because these technologies, some of them are going to stick, some of them are not. And somewhere in my office, I've got a floppy disk. Every once in a while, I come across it, like every five years or something, I come across it and I'm like, what the heck were people thinking? These freaking... You know, they're they're like these big giant squares that are bendable and and you literally cannot get the information off of these things anymore because the technology just doesn't exist. So I just wonder, as stuck as we get in our fears that things are going to be different, you've got generations of brand new people who are born understanding what we're trying to decipher right now that are eventually going to get to a point where they're going to be the generation that's making the changes that is on the cutting edge of things. How are they going to handle this problem? You know, I mean, it's just a different world. It's a different world from what we grew up in. And uh, it's just really complicated. It's, it's also one of those 
like it is really unsettling it's actually part of the reason why i got off of facebook it's part of the reason why i don't post a whole lot on my personal instagrams it is really upsetting to me how much personal information is out there and it is so easily accessible however at the other side of that think of how much information is at our tips like we would not have known about Shudu or about all these forgeries. We would not have been able to see other sides of it. There's so much information. I learned how to digitally paint based off of YouTube videos. <laughs> like there is that upside to having so much information. As long as you utilize it correctly, there is a gift to having all that information. It can be overwhelming too, but there is a gift to it. And as we are progressing, you know, as the scammers and hackers get smarter and smarter, we still have people that are getting smart as well. I heard that there's a hacker convention in Las Vegas, and the biggest booth is bought by the FBI. They're always recruiting hackers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I was told. I totally believe I, it's the smartest thing you could probably do is to get all of these hackers and have them doing something good. They're using this instead of, you know, accessing some old granny's information to get her bank account information. They're actually using their skills for national security. It's still terrifying that somebody can access all this information about me, but at the same time, it's also good to know. Yeah, you have, uh, you always have your girlfriends that are the best detectives in the world. They can instantly find a guy who texted you the night before and find out every bit of information about him based <laughs> off of the social media. <laughs> oh my god. It's a double-edged sword, and I, I think it's just like with anything, you know, one of my sayings, I have a million of them, and this is not my personal one, I'm sure I picked it up from somewhere, but it is a fine line between fear and knowledge and, or, you know, fear and confidence, I guess. And the difference is whether you succeed and, you know, sometimes you don't even know that you're being courageous. And there's so many variables in not just the way that you can approach a problem, but also in the results that you're going to get. And that's, again, because nothing is happening in a vacuum. There's just so many different factors that are pressing upon whatever it is that you're looking at to change the dynamics of the situation, to change the results. You know, there's no certainties of where we're going to go. And there's no certainties that the things that we're doing to try to create a more even playing field in the upheaval of AI as it's becoming bigger and widening possibilities that even anything that we do to try to rein it in might actually be the answer. So again, it's just so complex and so big. There probably isn't even just one solution. It might be just a bunch of solutions. Mm -hmm. I really like the one that you came up with though, that, you know, it's just going to be its own category and have some sort of labeling system. Like um, what's the big argument that Dang it, the terminology is completely escaping me, but people were saying that a lot of artists weren't creating their own music. They were using some sort of basically AI system to reproduce notes that they couldn't hit. And Oh, auto-tune. Auto-tune, thank you. There was such a big upheaval with that. And when I heard the arguments, I was like, so the synthesizer came in, right? And you could do all kinds of tuning after the fact. I mean, like most studio albums have been edited in some way. So auto-tune did not seem to be a problem to me. It's just like put a label on it that says this was created with auto-tune and it's well, art, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I'll still listen to some of that. And <laughs> I think that art can be handled in a similar fashion. This is an AI generated image and people can either choose to put that up on their wall, but I really like the idea of having a separate category of art. I think it would definitely help with creating that awareness of what has been AI created. It does still leave open the problem of the copyrights 
you know, other artists' images are being used, other artists' styles are being used. But then again, that's going to be a whole nother problem that may need a bunch of different solutions because... How do you decide it's your style when so many artists have very similar styles nowadays? Right. It's a big argument. You know, we're not going to solve it, but I think it's really great to be able to talk about it. There's a lot of issues and there's a lot of possibilities as well. And it's been a wonderful time. I learned a lot, especially about bugs. I didn't <laughs> know there was a spider that lived in a bubble in the pond. <laughs> I don't want to go in ponds anymore. <laughs> My God, that's so funny. Well, and just all the bugs that are in ponds. There are some really trippy, trippy bugs. And um, dragonflies, they can spend up to five years in a pond. That's where they develop up until they go through their metamorphic stage. But when they're underwater, they're called nymphs. You would think that they're really lovely, but they are like some of the most hideous looking little creatures. <laughs> <laughs> they look like they have a mask over their faces because their jaws are so enormous they're reticulating so they can actually unhinge them like where your tmj would come together your temporal mandibular joint and shoot that bottom jaw out to capture little fish or one of those other bugs that are swimming about and retract it back they are so vicious and just scary. And, you know, earlier we were talking about people farting in seats. When a dragonfly nymph think they're going to come into attack, they have these giant air-filled ladders and they will just let out this huge fart and shoot themselves across the wall. <laughs> humans too if they really want to do that and take the risk i mean i get an uncomfortable christmas family dinner and aunt rosie is coming over to attack your cheeks you know let one rip <laughs> you'll get away <laughs> exactly she'll be running so <laughs> clear a path <laughs> I mean, dragonflies are actually my favorite, but, and they, they're one of the only creatures that are alive today that have literally not changed in any manner from prehistoric days, except for their size. They're smaller than, than they were, but the rest of their structures is basically the same. So they're basically the perfect evolutionary being. Uh -huh. They haven't had a need to evolve yet. Exactly. Or or if they haven't died off and they've been able to maintain living, they're perfected. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're really cool. But yeah, I am always learning something new about bugs. And there's bugs that I hate. Like I will say mosquitoes are probably at the top of my list. Um, because they're, you know, they're just so awful, but pretty much everything else, there's a lot of other things that I think are really cool. And I don't like cockroaches, but scientists and researchers love cockroaches because they're apparently highly intelligent for insects. Really? Yeah. There's um, a group of scientists, I want to say they're in Japan, who have put miniature spy cameras on cockroaches and just sent them off and they're spying their actual spying bugs oh wow <laughs> um wow <laughs> i did a episode with a honey sommelier a master beekeeper anyway she can tell you so much about bees and she was telling me that the reason that there's this whole communication thing that goes on between flowers and bees and a flower actually has an electrical charge that bees can see. And if a bee has landed on a flower and gone through to mine all of its, you know, pollen and nectar and all of that sort of thing, it decreases that electrical field for 30 seconds or so up to a minute while it recharges its sugar content and all of that for the next bee. Wow. Isn't that crazy? So I gotta wonder now, 
I, I, I got to wonder now that when we say that humans are the most intelligent species on the planet, are we really intelligent or do we just not see and think and feel and communicate the same way as other animals. I remember one guy saying that animals don't have emotions, and I've heard an argument for that, that in order to make decisions, which fight or flight is a decision, Mm -hmm. you have to have an emotional connection. Not every animal responds the same to a decision. It's not like every fight or flight decision that's made is the same decision. It's, you know, some animals are paralyzed with fear. Some animals will fight. Um, I know antelope, some will go stand up to a cougar up in the Sierra Nevadas. You know, you just have to face the cougar and never turn your back on it. And I know some animals will choose to run. So I, I just have to sit here and I'm, I'm hearing about these bees and basically they see a, electric. Like I'm trying to imagine what that is like. It's probably not something I can fathom because you can't see electric the way we see it. Like it, it's just my mind is blown. I know. I know. It's I, I completely agree with everything that you're saying. You know, I, I think we're so damn smart that we convince ourselves that we are the smartest. <laughs> We're so damn smart that we convince ourselves that we're the smartest and therefore close ourselves off to other possibilities. Like there will be nobody smarter than me or no thing. And the fact that the flowers are communicating with the bees, you know, like, whoa, I know nothing. I literally know nothing. You know, it's just, it's a trip. Yeah. Oh my God. I know that the challenges of AI are going to continue to come up for discussion for a long time to come. So I really hope that this conversation encourages you to learn more about it, as well as those fascinating bugs and insects that are outside your window. Check the show notes for selected links and also keep sending in your questions and comments because I do read all of them. If you have a fun, amazing or inspiring story to share, please drop me a line because I'd love to hear it. The world needs more amazing stories. Also, please take a moment to rate this episode because your rating really does help move this podcast closer to the top of searches so that my friends and I can reach more people. I'm looking forward to sharing more upcoming in the company of friends talks with you. So be sure to follow me on the socials and the dot com all at the Queen Trail podcast. That's T-H-E-Q-U-A-I-N-T-R-E-L-L-E podcast. I am Sil Annan, the Queen Trow, and until next time, I wish you passion, adventure, knowledge, elegance, and beauty.